Hello, welcome. How are you today, guys? Just waiting for everyone to join. Nice to see you. Oh. Right, so in the meantime, I will start with a short introduction. Um, so first of all, let me introduce myself. So my name is Antonella. Um, probably some of you already know me, but anyway, uh, I'm, I'm part of the admission team and I specifically look after animation and storyboarding and previous courses and application here at Escape. Um, so today, uh, today I'm here with Iliana, our head um, lead tutor for the storyboarding and previous course. So the next intake actually is starting soon, in June 28. So if you're interested, then um, let me know. Anyway, I will be here at the Q&A to explain everything you want to know about the um, application process. But the main focus today, so the webinar, is about the storyboarding and previous course. So to give you an overview of what uh, is covered and what you can learn. And also, uh, we have here today Brad, with our industry mentor so from the third floor that you probably heard about and so he's today is here to tell you everything about the third floor and what a previous artist do and um he will give you so some insight also about the industry works and now we will provide feedback so now i will pass it to iliana if you have any question, guys, by the way, uh, feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we will answer it. And we will also leave some space uh, at the end to answer any other question you might have. Um, so, Ileana, feel free. Thank you. To Thank go you. Ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today we have a very, very interesting event. Uh, we have a special guest from the third floor, our industry partner. Uh, before I uh, give the floor to our guest, I will give you a quick overview of uh, what we are doing in uh, our course uh, uh, MA Storyboarding and Previsualization. Uh, I will, if you'll allow me to share my screen with you, I uh, will just show you quickly what our students have done in the uh, last year and a half. Um, just a quick share of my presentation. So um, hopefully you can see this screen well. Okay. Um, all right. So we have been... Um, we started this course in September 2019, um, and uh, it is a, pa a part of the animation department at Escape Studios, um, which is led by Alexander Williams. Um, uh, the course was approved by the University of Kent, and it was created uh, with the help of our industry partners, Blue Zoo Studios and other studios we work with. Um, uh, they are mentoring our course and they are um, uh, helping our students to understand what are the uh, industry standards and how the industry works um, so they can get prepared uh, for when they graduate. So. Um, we have some really um, successful little projects uh, finished by our graduates. Uh, our first cohort uh, uh, finished their MA course in October 2020, and they produced some really um, amazing uh, work. Um, so this is a journey that uh, we offer during this course. Uh, it does consist of five different modules, and for each module, students are advancing in different uh, areas. We uh, teach 2D and 3D uh, storyboarding techniques using software uh, which is professionally uh, approved and is uh, widely used in the uh, storyboarding uh, process uh, through the industry. Uh, one of them is uh, developed by Blue Zoo Studios. It is called Panel Forge, and it is a hybrid between 2D and 
3D software, which is quite nice to use, for, especially for people who cannot um, draw very well, people who don't have confidence in their drawing skills prefer to work with that software because it offers a um, combination of 3D assets uh, with 2D uh, sketchy uh, technique. Another one is Storyboard Pro, a Toon Boom product. Uh, we also use Blender, Maya, um, we use uh, Substance Painter and different other uh, digital design software packages which are available at Escape Studios and uh, students can have access to them. Uh, there is a journey which they need to go through. As I said already, um, students study screenplay writing for a start. They uh, learn how to use uh, different writing software for screenplay, such as um, final draft and cell text. Then they learn how to break down the prose from Word and turn it into an image, which is very interesting process as well. They create thumbnails for storyboarding. Um, they create concept art. Uh, they can uh, learn uh, how to design environment and characters. And also they create animatics. Um, they learn um, basic editing techniques, 3D modeling basic techniques as well, basic texturing, rigging, animation, lighting, rendering, everything that can help production to uh, move forward. And here are some examples of students' work. Uh, this is uh, part of a project um, from Leroy Dias. He graduated last year. Uh, a project for series. Um, it's quite interesting uh, project. I'm not going to say the story, but uh, these are examples of thumbnails and character exploration, emotion, uh, expressions, uh, color um, suggestions for design. Uh, some small preliminary thumbnails before even they can be scaled up and turned into nice clear illustrations. Students are exploring the camera direction and the composition and um, the flow of the story uh, prior turning it into an animatic. Of course, you can see here some other sketches. This is a map of the space where the action is taking um, place in the story and um, something like a, a, a ma map for the for the environment. Um, here is uh, another example of how a storyboard can be taken further into a 3D uh, concept uh, where students are exploring um, generating crowd and how would this be possible in Maya, for example, or Blender. Uh, this is another example of a storyboard created in Panel Forge, which is what I just mentioned. This is the Blue Zoo Studio um, application, which has been used here. Nicely uh, saving time for production where students can just grab some ready assets from the web, put them in the scene and try to create quickly some uh, sketches. What is very important in storyboarding is to be able to quickly visualize uh, the uh, story uh, in terms of images. Um, and this is very important and students are trying to make sure that they can do it in a very short space of time. Here is an example of uh, a pitch Bible presentation from one of the projects uh, we had uh, delivered last year. As you can see, there is a lot of uh, opportunities to explore uh, different techniques, not just 3D, but 2D. Uh, this has been produced in uh, Photoshop by Molly Babington. And of course, it's been um, very clearly um, showing what the story uh, would look like. Um, this is another example of um, creating facial rig for a, a model which was used in uh, one of the students' uh, short film. The Moon Rocks is uh, the project that Molly created and she was trying to learn about uh, the facial rig and how the character can express different emotional um, stages. And this is again an example of uh, some lighting keys which were created uh, during the project development. Other type of um, illustrations that have slightly different approach, but again, uh, they uh, represent the idea of a story which is now under the development uh, from another student called um, uh, Brodiaga. It's about a dog, a stray dog. Uh, and it was really a nice little story, which is again, um, planned to be in a 2D technique. So we explore different techniques, as you can see from this presentation, anything you uh, like to work with in terms of um, 
uh, tool set you're allowed to, uh, there is no restrictions. Uh, students have the choice how they're going to express their creative um, um, thoughts and how they want to deliver the final project. So here is again, an example of different uh, sketches for environment, storyboarding panels. This is how Toon Boom Storyboard Pro is um, exporting the, the final storyboard uh, document, which is very important for the executives and the director and the producer to be able to list quickly through the uh, pages and make any revisions if they needed, uh, put any notes and uh, write uh, on, on top of the page if they need to. Um, of course, this is not the final uh, concept. There will be animatic, which is also consisting of a timeline. Um, the animatic also gives information about the length of the uh, film and also uh, is synchronized with sound design and um, music. The third module during the, the course is about previsualization as well. Um, students start learning uh, slowly if they, if they don't know anything about 3D, this is the time when they can start actively create some uh, characters, they can model not just characters, environments as well, and they can learn about the topology theory and how uh, the um, characters edge loops need to be uh, lined up in order to work and function well in animation. Here are some examples of um, mixture between um, previs and production work. This is when the students uh, started creating collaborative projects with other groups, not just with our class, but they um, collectively produce a story with the uh, students from animation class, from um, the VFX and from the compositing group. So this is all the MA students are combining their skills and come back with some ready uh, film. And this is, um, uh, of course, examples of uh, what has been produced last year as a final uh, project. Uh, Street Rats won numerous awards uh, from Austin Hills, Story, Anastasia's um, uh, Animal Lover as well. All these films uh, went to festivals, they were well received and um, we were very, very proud with what uh, we uh, managed to create last year. So this is going well this year as well. We've got new uh, cohort with very talented students who are now going to graduate as well um, this year in October. And they also have lots of uh, help and support from uh, our industry partners, the third floor, Blue Zoo, uh, Passion Pictures, Fudge animation as well. So this is my presentation about the course. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen. And I would like to um, invite you to um, uh, welcome our special guest today, uh, Brad Blackburn from the third floor. We are uh, very excited to have you. Welcome. Brad, um, we, we are very excited to have you today. Um, our special guest will talk about uh, um, the pre-visualization process. Uh, Brad Blackburn is a virtual production manager from uh, the Third Floor Studios, and he is uh, here to uh, cover some invaluable topics, such as um, what previous artists do, what skills students should have to work as previous artists, how mentors provide feedback and how industry feedback works. Uh, just to give you a quick uh, background of uh, Brad's impressive professional profile. Uh, prior to joining the uh, team at the third floor, Brad was founder and managing director of visualization company IO Entertainment, as well as holding many strategic creative roles, including uh, head of layout and previous at DreamWorks Animation, head of previous at Double Negative, director of photography at Framestore, and supervising director at Stardust Entertainment. Uh, Brad has supervised and contributed to a long list of BAFTA Academy Award and Emmy Award nominated projects, just to name but a few. Assassin's Creed, Avatar, Harry Potter, Kung Fu Panda, The Tale of Despero, Flash Away, DJ Hero, as well as many other high profile projects, including Spider-Man, Far From Home, Aladdin, The Mummy, Heart of the Sea, 
Bounce Legacy, John Carter, Captain America, the list is very long. Welcome, Brad, and great pleasure to meet you and to host this webinar with you today. Uh, my first question uh, will be, could you tell us about yourself and your professional journey in virtual production and what does your job entail and what skills are required? Floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ileana. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me um, today and uh, thanks everybody to, for joining. Um, I'm going to sort of whip through presentations with some visual material. Um, I'll share my screen now, but uh, bear with me because I usually manage to mess this up. Uh, let me have a look. I think this is the last one. We'll try this. And uh, Yes, that's, that's, that's what we're seeing. Good. Yeah. Okay, that's good. All right, so... Um, Yep, so I'm from the third floor, obviously. Um, we specialize in visualization. Um, there's many forms of viz, many vizes, as we say. Um, so I'm gonna sort of try to sort of go over those. And again, uh, I, I wanna link this in again with, with some of the things Ileana was showing about storyboarding. Um, you know, previous, a lot of the time is just a 3D storyboard. Um, and so every, every sort of creative and technical and sort of uh, questioning process you use when you storyboard, uh, it's the same thing that you do in 3D afterwards. So anything you do with storyboarding is super useful. Um, I'll try to keep moving quickly because we've got a bunch of material and I want to make sure we have time for questions. So um, hopefully on your screen, there's a very handsome gentleman in an awesome shirt. Um, he looks a bit like me. Um, but so just sort of Going back to, to Eliana's question, um, I'm sort of rewinding, you know, how I ended up where I was, because uh, one of the great things with our industry and especially the area we're in in previous, we collect all sorts of interesting people from all over the world and from many different backgrounds. Um, what we mainly look for is creative problem solvers. It might be story focused, uh, you know, problems we're trying to deal with. It might be technical problems, but creative problem solvers is kind of a a nice general wrapper for um, what we sort of looked through in, in previous. Um, so yeah, back back to the beginning. Uh, I started out in the 90s um, and uh, in Australia, hence the accent. Um, there wasn't much going on, to be honest, back there. I think Animal Logic uh, was one of the few companies in existence and they did a few commercials, but not much else. So this is pre-Matrix days. Um, so there was no internet no YouTube videos, none of the uh, training courses or free software. Um, so very hard to get into an industry that was a bit invisible. Um, so the way I managed to do it, because I was doing graphic design at the time, was just trying to get deeper into good, you know, a more complex CG, having seen sort of, you know, uh, Toy Story and Jurassic Park and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just picked up the old yellow pages, which we don't really see these much these days, but massive big telephone book of all the businesses. And I just went through all the sections that were like TV or something or other that seemed relevant. I just called each of the companies and asked if they did 3D animation. Um, it took a long time. I think it took about a year before I found what the names of those sorts of companies were and what it was I needed to ask. Um, uh, and finally you know started to isolate uh, who these people were that's how i discovered animal logic um called them asked them some really stupid questions what are nerves um was one of my questions uh but they were super helpful um so they were lovely um and one of the things to remember back in those days the barriers to entry uh cost wise were huge um there wasn't the trickle down of 3d software to pcs at that point to desktops um because the graphics cards that we know and love today, the NVIDIAs that we game on or, or work on, those really, they weren't a thing. They were just about to come out. Um, but so in order to get something that could do a more than a wireframe object in 3D, you had to basically get dedicated workstations. And at the time, there was a company called Silicon Graphics that did basically the whole film and physics and nuclear and military uh, industries uh, PCs. Uh, and they started at about 80,000 pounds for one of those. Uh, and then any 3D software that ran on those was about 20 to 30,000 pounds per copy. Um, and then if you wanted, you know, uh, manuals to go with it, that was like another 500 to 1,000 pounds for the software manuals. So um, there was no way to learn any of that stuff unless you had access to 
um, a machine that basically was worth more than your house. Um, so it took me a while to cut a deal with a place so I could learn at night on their systems when they went home after I finished my day job. And I basically worked my way through these manuals on their quarter of a million dollars worth of equipment um, so that I could be of use. Um, and then I started doing demos for them um, and uh, talking to customers who were trying to get things working. Um, and then I gradually transitioned from my graphic design job uh, and finally got like, I got to animate a butterfly in a TV commercial and that was my first paid gig. Um, and from there, I sort of, you know, just kept moving on and on. Um, and again, it's an industry that supports, you know, it's all around the world, it's huge demand. So uh, one of my big things was wanting to travel. I wanted to work overseas uh, and keep traveling. So from there, I sort of went to Kuala Lumpur, Southeast Asia after a couple of years, ran a 3D department, went to Berlin, directed animated series, went to LA, worked at DreamWorks, and then came back over to uh, London, having done a couple of sprinkles of some time in Rome doing commercials, et cetera. Um, so there's lots of opportunities out there. And the big thing is wonderful people from all over the world to spend time with. Um, so that was sort of where I started. And now I've sort of having directed and supervised Anim, I realized the most interesting point of the whole process where all of the storytelling locked in for me when I was directing was in what we called like digital layout or something at the time back in the 90s. Basically, it was what Previs was going to become. So I never went back to animation. Uh, I just stuck with Previs after that because after that, it slowed down and to me got a little bit boring. I just like to lock all the story stuff and move on. Um, so that led me eventually to where I am now. Um, and then I've been transitioning out of previews and supervising previews on a bunch of movies for the last sort of 15 years. Now I'm sort of shifting across into virtual production, which is, you know, the real time version of previews, if you will. Um, and it's a very exciting time to be in the industry. It's like the 90s all over again. It's like Jurassic Park days. It's just the world is changing with all the stuff we do. And it's super exciting. Um, and so I'm lucky enough to manage a fantastic team of people there. Very, very clever. We're very small. Um, I think there's about eight or nine of us in my team, but we've nearly tripled in size uh, this year um, because virtual production is going gangbusters. Um, so I manage the team um, and uh, interact with all the clients across all the projects before sort of handing off to the senior people uh, from my team that are covering each show. Uh, I work with the recruitment, work out training that's required. Um, I also like to dabble in actually developing tools and things myself, but I do not get enough time. Hence, I've been learning C++ on my weekends because I'm just too busy during the week. Um, and then uh, part of my job with outreach as well at Third Floor is um, sort of uh, interacting with the whole filmmaking community, um, gaming community as well through UK and Europe, um, looking at how some of the techniques that we've got or that we may have sometime soon might help them uh, get more creative freedom or more creative iterations or better help them answer some of their creative or technical questions. Um, and then I do lots of demos of tools and um, I think, as it says here, I act as a technology evangelist, which is pretty cool. I got to get that on my card. Uh, I don't have that yet, but I will. Um, so jumping along, I'm just going to play a little bit of material. I'll adjust the volume because I don't want to blow eardrums. Uh, let's just start low and see how it goes. Uh, and there's a little bit of an overview of some previous sort of things. And there's a couple more videos I'll show, but um, I'll keep it moving because I talk too much.
it was cool. I haven't seen a lot of that stuff. Some of my shots got in there. Happy days. Um, so that hopefully, um, let me not play it again, sort of shows a good overview. Um, and uh, again, as I say, I know I sort of talk a lot, so definitely feel free to interrupt with any questions or bits that leap up that might be relevant. Um, so, you know, again, hopefully from that, you can see the sort of range of material we work on. That one's pretty glossy because that's the 15 year anniversary reel. Um, so it tends to be pretty much the top end. We do a lot of simpler stuff and uh, smaller budget things as well. Um, but that's the sexy stuff. So I guess that's why it makes it in. Um, running over the sort of the range of visas that we sort of work on. Um, some of them are well known, other ones not so much. Uh, just sort of as a breakdown, uh, first of all, we sort of, we cover pitch fizz. That traditionally is kind of the glossiest, highest end uh, pre viz type material we do. And this is because usually that happens when uh, a project uh, a director or, or a producer or someone has been given a bunch of development cash to go off and, you know, cause they've got a great script. They've got some cool people attached. Um, the studio is interested in the concept, but they're not fully committed yet. So they give them a bunch of cash and they need to come back with the presentation of how kick-ass the movie is gonna be and therefore why it will make squillions. Um, so the pitch fizz we do is it's kind of a bit like the sort of um, the, the trailer for a game or something, not the gameplay necessarily, because that might be slightly compromised. This is the super glossy cinematic version of the, the gameplay. Um, you know, it's so awesome. You'll never quite see it on your own PC. But so this pitch fizz, we, you know, don't tend to have live action footage. It will just be a full 3D, like a really glossy AAA game cinematic. Um, and that goes back to the execs of the studio with the theory that off the back of it, they're going to unlock a whole truckload of money and say, go make this movie. Um, and here's a uh, hundred million dollars. Um, so I've done a bunch of those. Um, I've worked on some of them. Uh, I remember one of them was successful, and this is a ways back, was uh, for Dean Devlin, uh, Geo Storm uh, is a good example of that. We did pitch fizz for that. Uh, and again, you know, off the back of it, they, they got a massive deal to go make that movie. Um, so super glossy. It's about selling the idea and the experience uh, of amazingness. Um, and... So that's not looking to answer any technical questions. It's not about practicality. It's just about awesomeness. Um, so those can be a lot of fun. Uh, some people absolutely love that stuff. Some people are not into the, going to that high level of detail and fussing. Horses for courses. Um, next along the list, we've got previs. So again, you know, somewhat similar, and most people are familiar this, with this. The theory with previs is it's there to be a full 3D storyboard of either entire sequences, entire films sometimes, um, but usually to cover the very complicated sequences that will involve massive visual effects or uh, potentially dangerous special effects stunts, that type of thing. Um, so it might answer a number of questions. And again, the key thing for us as a previous company, when we come onto a project, what we really wanna know, the, what we like to ask is, what questions are we here to help you answer? Because that's the thing with, with previs. Um, it's not just one thing where every show, every director, every VFX supervisor, every DP, every exec producer or showrunner, they have different constraints they're working. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's not money at all. Um, so we may be there to focus on just doing, uh, helping the director find a way to unlock their story. And it's all about storytelling. So again, 3D storyboarding. Um, sometimes it's a mix of many factors, um, but hopefully during the previous stage, it's mainly about creating a nice cutting version of the film containing all the CG elements, et cetera, uh, that everybody can just sign off on and go, that's what we're shooting. Let's break it down. Let's get a shot list together and work out a shooting schedule. Um, so the previous doesn't provide that, it provides the blueprint that you then turn into all of the data for planning, planning the film production. And that's where we tend to then shift it once we've got creative approval, shift it into tech fears. 
Uh, this is not a very creative sort of part of the process. There is some creativity involved a lot of times, but it's, it's very technically minded. Um, not everyone will be doing all of these parts. Some artists love jumping between all of them. Some have very bespoke focuses. Um, Tech Fizz is slightly more nerdy and we have a lot of cool uh, nerdy type folks that um, enjoy breaking all of the things down. Uh, so I think I've got a little bit of footage of um, uh, the Tech Fizz uh, just to explain a little bit better. But basically you take the pre -viz, you look at the real world constraints. How is this going to be shot on the day? What, what camera, what cranes the camera on, what tracks the, the, um, the crane on? uh is it on a is it on a cable are there safety issues are we shooting a person on a hydraulic rig um is there flame is there explosions are there things falling uh what's going to be real what's going to become a digital double etc 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 the tech viz explodes the previous 3d shot into all the real world components and all of the vfx components so that they can be broken down and planned um, then with your tech viz, you plan your shoot, you build all sorts of stuff, got all the blueprints, you shoot, and then you get the footage from that back as soon as possible. And then in a lot of these big, say like Marvel, Lucasfilm type things, uh, the footage has got lots of green or blue or empty skies where there'll be cool, exciting stuff later on. It can be difficult for the editor to edit that footage when the creatures are not there or the spaceship's not flying through or the explosion's not happening or the magical something or other is not spinning around. Um, and that stuff needs to be edited and presented and get feedback and stuff. So that's what we do post fears. We basically take the plates and then we use parts of our, we go back into our previs, pull out all the elements as comp layers and then maybe having adjusted the previous a bit, having tracked the real camera of what happened, will regenerate previous layers and then comp them back in so that in theory, the editor now has a rough, almost what we call a VFX temp, but don't tell VFX because ours are a bit rubbish, um, but it's kind of a temp version of what that shot will look like with all the VFX in. Um, so he can edit together, everyone can follow it. You can buy off on the edit. And then also for the visual effects vendors who've put in bids, this gives them a nice blueprint now so they know exactly what elements are in. Because when they bid it, that was probably months ago, everything's gone out the window, plans changed. Um, popped on the end of this slide is virtual production. Um, it's its own sort of little thing at the moment, but it's creeping into everything. Um, and really in a way that should go before previous now because we're getting virtual production is uh, basically using real-time tools to empower pre-production. So you can integrate uh, more people directly with CG content. They can, you know, people who are not Maya savvy um, or Unreal Engine savvy, it might be the DP, it might be a, an art director or something. They have some real-time way of interacting with what will be virtual content. Um, and that's mainly what that's there for. So. Um, that's most of the visas. There's more visas, but de design visas, all sorts of stuff, but we won't go into that today. Um, as far as scope and the different sort of, you know, verticals that we fit into, um, feature film is our mainstay and has been sort of since the beginning. Um, and uh, we work on a lot of high-end TV, heaps of Netflix, um, Apple, Amazon stuff, uh, themed attractions, so, you know, uh, theme parks, some people might call them. Uh, we do quite a bit of uh, work with uh, those guys around the world. Um, we do a bunch of work with games companies, uh, usually around their cinematics. Uh, so I think, you know, all the Apex Legends um, uh, trailers that come out, we pre all of those entirely. Um, and then generally the studios themselves then go about making them all based on our, our previs with that they've got all the assets and their custom engines etc um, and then we've done a little bit of VR and AR um, some experiences um, along the way and uh, we do a small amount of commercials um, normally because we're quite busy uh, we don't have time to fit in many commercials and things and again for us to get involved they usually there's usually some very specific complex needs that makes it uh, a good idea for us to get involved um, 
So there we go, scope of work. Um, and then looking over roles, um, uh, you know, it's all pretty plain there, you know, storyboarding, love storyboarding, um, previs and post-vis artists. So again, previs, you know, let's just call it Maya, post-vis, let's say After Effects, Nuke, bringing the previs components as render layers and then putting them over the plate, uh, a bit of tracking. Uh, production support. So we have quite a big uh, production team who are tracking, interacting with clients, interacting with artists, managing workflows, making sure we're hitting milestones. Um, we have a lot of data coming backwards and forwards, especially once you work on Disney Marvel shows, the reporting structures going backwards and forwards to clients are not trivial. There's a lot of information that they're swapping around. Uh, virtual production, that's me, that's my team. Um, we've got editors, because you can see with our reels and things, we have to edit a lot of material together. Um, uh, game engineers, so you know, C++, dev kind of thing. Um, we're integrating more of uh, those sorts of folks in as the virtual production thing just keeps growing. Uh, and VR designers, again, you know, they can be called TAs, TDs, there's different terms, uh, mainly borrowed from the games world. Um, but that sort of covers the bulk of the types of roles we've got. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a little sort of breakdown insight into what we're sort of looking at. Again, you know, my one liner is creative problem solvers. Um, this is probably a better version. What have we got here? Um, you know, skilled and versatile. Again, we're responding to the bespoke requests of clients on a film. Every show is different. There is no rule of what we're doing and what the client needs us to do. Um, uh, and then when we start to look at sort of subcomponents and specialities, we've got shot creators who, who create shots, um, not surprisingly. So key focus on story composition, editing, animation, um, you know, clarity of vision with trying to communicate stories visually. Um, asset builders, we have a bunch of people that really just like creating assets, stuff, environments, worlds, creatures, um, so modeling, shading, etc. Um, and then, you know, the additional skill sets um, that people don't tend to arrive with, um, they tend to learn them with us. Um, you know, compositing, some people know that, uh, tr camera tracking and things through th something like PF track. Um, uh, we're pulling in a lot of motion capture these days, more than, you know, doing lots and lots of hand animation of, you know, people walking around doing stuff. Um, uh, effects, you know, fire explosions, simulations of bits. We try not to go too far on that, but we do do a little bit. Um, and virtual reality, which I think we need to get rid of virtual reality because it's becoming a bit passe, but, um, you know, uh, real time uh, engine based skill sets might be a better term there. Um, so software wise, no surprise, I don't think for anyone. Maya has been the mainstay um, of previs since version one. Um, and After Effects is our default comping uh, sort of package, just for historical reasons. It's, it's quite unusual in most other places. But for us, it's always been the previs go to. Um, asset building, Maya, Photoshop, ZBrush, Substance. Um, we are seeing things like Blender creeping in because it's just it's good at what it does um, and the price is fantastic um, uh, and it's just growing it's getting stronger and stronger We've got some lovely lovely features in it so um, we're big fans of Blender it just doesn't tend to pipeline the way something like Maya does um, and uh, you know for post viz again you know combining the live action with the CG layers um, again Maya After Effects PF track for tracking and Nuke if people are cool with Nuke, then you can use that as well. Um, and then virtual production, Unreal Engine. Um, and a note there with Unreal is it's it's moving quite aggressively out of just virtual production and it's starting to nibble at a lot of other things. Um, you know, they're putting in comping stuff, they're putting in uh, basic modeling, they're putting in animation rigs and things. So um, we see over the next few years, uh, the sort of thing of being 99% Maya, 1% Unreal will start to shift quite markedly uh, and we'll do more in Unreal Engine, we, we believe. Um, and then uh, additional skill sets that we love, um, knowledge of cameras, you know, which end you point at the people. Um, no, it's, you know, you know, lenses, 
what's when you what's the difference between putting a 24 and a 75 uh when do you use them uh what effects do they have you know it's not again we expect people to arrive at the door just knowing that stuff we have a lot of training material um but if you know that stuff that's 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 brilliant um rigging you know if you if you can rig doesn't have to be complicated um but just doing basic rigging and mire of props or something that means we don't have to pull an asset person to come and you know uh, rig up something that's got uh, two pivot points um and a little controller on it mal scripting uh starting to go more nerdy here um and then what's missing from that one i think which we'll probably need to put in these days is python uh because mal scripting is very specialized but still cool um but we tend to do more of our coding for tools and and that sort of thing in python at the moment and then uh mocap cleanup and that sort of thing again not a skill a lot of people just sort of arrive with um moving along still um just sort of going over again you know previous and i think we've covered it a bit but going into more of the details um it's it's part of the big the visualization process um and again scribbling a drawing on a post-it note is part of the visualization process uh and the quicker you are and the better your drawings are the more viz you can do with a pencil um but as far as the previous where we're talking about our side of things the traditional maya sort of 3d it's a it is this sandbox to basically bring in puppets uh and pretend cameras and a pretend world basically rehearse and block and try different things and different cameras and movements and timing and etc cetera, etc cetera. um so it's you know in a way it's 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 the it's the cool version of having some lego characters and an iphone um and you get to explore your filming ideas in the computer um you know and again if they want to go crazy with lighting etc we can start doing that the question just comes up of whether that's the best use of time usually during previews um on a lot of star wars and marvel things because of the numbers of people involved and their different backgrounds in the approval process we tend to notch up the level of finish so a lot of the marvel stuff is pretty sexy um it's not really required all that detail to answer basic questions but again if it's going to be presented to executives who need to agree to budget changes and things uh, it has to be really clear what this money is going to be doing um so then we add a lot more gloss um and it's a way again for directors and producers to explore ideas early um and uh, that uh you know again one of the key things i've said to sort of said to people with um previous part of the reason it's there is to throw away things um you know it's a way to explore ideas and eliminate weak ones so you don't have to do that on set or at some other really expensive point you don't want to go wow that was a dead end we shouldn't have ever gone down this path hopefully previous you did that you threw it away and you went down a good path um and so that's kind of, you know, again, part of the questions that we're there to answer. It, should this idea go in the film? Is this shot worth spending money on? Does it, does it earn its spot in this film? Um, now, uh, I'll just crack off this one. Um, I think this is an example. I think there's a bit of useful uh, audio here. So I'm just going to just double check that it's coming through properly. At the third floor, we're often called on to help show the idea of a project or a scene before it gets started. Welcome to the end here there are worlds above worlds above worlds. It's where I used to live. And it's where you're gonna die. For Alita Battle Angel, yeah. we created this pitch piece with the filmmakers to provide a snapshot of what the characters and the world could be like in a big screen form. Using previs, you can do simple blocking or take the look up to very high quality textured renders. We work from a beat sheet and storyboards to frame angles that directors and producers like and that look cool and different. Dance, little flea. The filmmakers wanted to show off fighting styles that would be a hallmark of the Alita universe. We incorporated motion capture to add believability to the previs of key action and stunts. After we modeled and animated the shots, the film's picture editor, Steven Rivkin, assembled them into a cut with sound effects, music, and dialogue. This helped the piece really capture the cinematic potential of the material within the pitch package. Super cool. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time, so I'm going to keep it keep it moving. So again, just a good example, that piece answering questions about that fight sequence. Um, and although we edit our own material together to make sure we're sort of trying to tell a clear sequence, 
uh, on a lot of the movies, hopefully we get to work directly with the picture editor who then starts to own the process and work with the director. Um, I'm going to quickly jump over tech viz, um, some of the stuff I talked about. So it could be just a simple one pager. Looks like something, a technical drawing out of Photoshop. Uh, PDFs could be, you know, four quick times uh, from all different angles with different things showing in, a, in, a, in an HD sort of master. Um, it might be answering where the green screen goes, what lens is this on, how fast the camera moving, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think again, there's some useful stuff, so I'll keep the audio. Hey everyone. I wanted to give a brief explanation of what TechBiz means. At its core, TechBiz is the technical documentation of previs and postvis shots to clearly translate our 3D world into a format that can be used by onset departments to successfully set up a shot or a series of shots. Here at the third floor, we stress the importance of creating visualization that is both beautiful and practical. This means creating shots that have grounding in real world physics. And in the case of TechBiz, grounded by demonstrable measurement and evaluation. To this end, we use everything from physically accurate camera cranes to our own 3D LiDAR scans to ensure that what the client sees in our previs is what they will get on set. In this short commercial spot, you can see how we take very simple previs and expand it into an executable plan for the shoot. Here, we start with LiDAR scan to get an accurate representation of the limits of the environment we will be shooting in. Next, we use our Techno Dolly Rig to ensure that all of our camera movement is within the reach and speed of the crane's limits. Lastly, we carefully measure the position of subjects relative to the camera so that the positioning of the characters is one-to-one -one with the previous. And I think that's a, a good example there with um, especially that little commercial at the end. Um, a lot of times we go on to the smaller budget films we're not there to do creative story exploration. Um, they've got limited budgets. That's not a great use of the money for us. We tend to get involved when they have a complex shot, maybe two or three shots in the film that are potentially very complicated. They've got limited time and limited space to do it. And we tend to do tech viz for them. We help rough out what it will look like. They go, yes, that's, that's what we're after. But we've done it with the camera already mounted into a crane rig, making sure it doesn't punch a hole in the wall and we don't see off you know, the green screen too much so they don't have to do too much post, et cetera. Um, so I've, you know, sometimes we might work for one day on a, on a show and, and just produce, you know, in that case, the question that we're there to answer is how can we shoot this? It's not, you know, what would be a cool idea for my film? Um, so with the feedback process, um, and I'm gonna, try to get through this so we've got like 10 minutes uh, because I'm going to get snatched into a client call, I think at six. Um, the, so, so the feedback itself in our industry, again, because it's so iterative, um, uh, some people initially can find it a little bit tricky hearing uh, basically rejection so much. But again, that's the point of previs. If we can prove that an idea is poor and should be abandoned immediately, then that's a success. Um, and I've sort of put that in here, I think, is that, you know, we're there to fail fast, um, not slow and expensively. We're there to, and this is where we love the, you know, the sort of metaphor of the post-it note with the pencil. If you can get a post-it note and do a quick thing and go that, and they go, no, I hate it. That's it. That's all it costs in order to eliminate that idea. Then you scribble like this, uh, wider. <laughs> yeah, okay, boom previous done. Um, so we eliminated two bad ideas and we kept one. Uh, and so that is part of the thing of, you know, uh, of previous. We are there to explore and to get rid of ideas that shouldn't make it on screen. Um, and it's a slightly different process to what some people are accustomed to. Um, uh, and most of the feedback is not about how great or what is great. <laughs> it's about what's not working. Um, and, but that's the thing. You eliminate all the things that are not working until it's like, yeah, yeah, I guess that'll work. Um, and that's a success. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things, because of all of that, the way that works, we try to be aware of, you know, let, reminding people the feedback is about what's not working in the shot. It's not about the person who did the shot, <laughs> especially some of the people are very blunt. Uh, we do get some feedback. It's like, what the bleep? That's the feedback. I don't know what this is. Um, so uh, 
then we try to clarify and do better. Um, and then again, just because of the structures with the way it works in the industry itself, there's, there can be many layers of who's approving what, who's talking to who and approves the thing that he approved. And um, But basically sort of, you know, when you come in an entry level, you'll tend to get immediate feedback from a, a senior artist or a lead artist on the show. They're helping shape it. Um, then it goes to the previous supervisor. Uh, so he's again, third floor. Um, he's sort of, again, looking over the whole thing and is basically saying that's ready to present to the clients now. Uh, I think that's delivering on what they asked. Uh, then a lot of the times we'll be going, that'll be presented to the VFX supervisor, but it could be the director. Very, every show, there'll be a different reporting structure. Um, so we can't assume anything. At some point, we're hoping it gets in front of the director. Um, and that feedback sort of trickles down. Uh, and then we just go in circles until the director goes, yep, next. What else you got? Um, and again, you know, just from our side, the less people that get between the artist and if it's the director who's the end client, the better. If we can compress that to like one or two people, then we get much clearer sort of feedback systems. No surprises, I don't think, there for people. Um, and then that shows all of our social thingies. Uh, I wouldn't know what to do with a lot of those, but I'm sure there are people here that uh, find that stuff useful. So make sure you grab all that. Um, but yes, that's sort of a, a quick trip through. Um, there's lots of stories that go with that, but that would take hours. So um, hopefully that's useful. And hopefully we've got some time for some questions. Thank you so much, Brad. It was really a very, very informative and insightful presentation. Um, you've answered already some of the questions in the chat, <laughs> one of which uh, oh, I would like to mention again. Uh, the 2D illustration, as uh, someone who is really interested in 2D illustration, I wanted to ask, is the majority of previous work 3D stuff? Is there any space for 3D artists? So you've already answered this question, but if you want to add anything to it. Yeah, I, I just say again, um, you know, story be, storyboarding is a form of previous. We do actually go and recruit storyboarders, but if that's someone's passion, um, they should pursue that because it is always useful and it's always faster. If you can go through your own ideas quickly and thumbnails, like some of the examples you showed, that saves you going into Maya and spending a lot longer exploring those ideas. So you can even eliminate your own weak ideas in like 60 seconds. And that time Maya hasn't even booted up properly. Um, but, you know, and just on that note, one of the guys that I hired out of um, college uh, a number of years back, he storyboarded a, a bunch of stuff and previs beautifully. Uh, he now doesn't previs anymore. He just storyboards uh, for all the big Marvel movies. Uh, so uh, if he hadn't kept storyboarding, he wouldn't be doing that. So he has, all the directors have his phone number. They call him <laughs> and tell him to come on in because there's some ideas they want to talk about. Um, so yes, if you can storyboard, wow, storyboard. Excellent. So, so have you been in a situation when you have to go on a set and there is no already assets yet, there is no uh, finished, completed, nailed story uh, and you had to deliver uh, visualization and what do you do um that that happens the more the bigger the project the more money involved and especially when they've got time flexibility that happens a bit there are times literally uh and some people love it where we get told we're going to rewrite all of this um it's going to take a few weeks why don't you guys just come up with some cool ideas um and we've got the heroes, we've got some creatures, we've got some logic rules, and maybe we know where it's going to be based. So then the artists just sit down and come up with cool ideas for, you know, superheroes or Avengers or someone to do. And the director just sifts through and goes, oh, yeah, that's nice. Let's keep that one. Um, and then when the script comes back again, they pop a bunch of these in there. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, uh, that's that's the sort of thing that happens on bigger films because it's just easier to keep us rolling and Mars well we're 3d storyboarding effectively on smaller shows of course you know that that's not a good use of their budget um so we tend to sort of ramp down quickly and then wait and then ramp back up again so there is a lot of scope of improvisation i guess in this uh, very process. much and again depending on the show uh, a chris nolan show not so much um you know uh, 
the sort of the story emerges from Chris's Chris Nolan's head like the word of God. Um, and uh, you basically do exactly what it is he's describing. Um, but then that's his thing. He's He's got the picture there. He just needs you to do some stuff so that they could get some data out. There's other directors that are not uh, Ron Howard, for instance, um, super laid back and collaborative. He, in the early stages of his films, um, it's just a very open collaboration. He just some like he sit, sat down at the table and just went, hey guys, what do you reckon would be a cool way to open the movie? And that was the start of our meeting. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and that's the thing, it's just we're, we're there to serve the show and we're there to serve usually the director. Um, uh, and so depending on who they are, how they like to work, um, you know, then we okay. we provide that service. Some just want to work with the actors. They don't really want to deal with the whole previous thing. Um, that's that doesn't float their boat. They don't get excited. It's they just want to get some actors out in cardboard boxes and block some scenes and emote. Um, in which case, we'll probably be working mainly with the VFX supervisor. So again, it's so dependent. What's the show? Who's it for? And who's directing, producing, and VFX supervising? Um, and that's where it's unusual. Even with the Marvel shows, they've had a pattern now of picking unusual combinations of directors and DPs that have very different backgrounds. Um, so it's very exciting working with them. They've come. Some of them have come from, you know, um, backgrounds where they've not shot anything that's more than like a ten million dollar film, and suddenly they're on a hundred and fifty million dollar film with visual effects, and they've never used visual effects and but you know it, that's the thing it's it's very stimulating for everyone it's very exciting and so again what we'll do for them will be different to someone who's just come off mandalorian season two um they know what they're doing with a lot of stuff so we'll probably provide a different service thank you there is a nice uh, question which i'd like to pose here as well i'm conscious of the time because you have to be um <laughs> I, I asked them not to to schedule a call at the back of this but clients yeah. what can you do with clients say eh? Just a quick one. Um, you, you, could you talk a bit more about your work with the virtual production? What are the main differences from the previous work you have done before on top of the Unreal? Yeah. What are the skills necessary? To work yeah, I, I think, again, it's just a, it's a general comment to anyone getting especially into this site. If you're interested in Viz, just learn Unreal. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly how much it's going to play into every corner, but, you know, let's be honest, the... Mm, Epic is taking the money that the kids spent on buying skins for Fortnite um, and they're basically doing R&D, hundreds of millions of dollars of R&D for the filmmaking community, putting it onto Unreal and then giving it to you for free. Um, so it, it can't be ignored. They're moving so fast um, and they work so closely with key people in the industry. Um, so, you know, always just any opportunity to learn Unreal, you will not regret it. Um, the key differences there, I think, are it's just Maya and the traditional, what we're starting to call legacy now, legacy previs, is a sort of linear process. Um, you know, it's offline, it's slow, you're not animating at 24 frames a second while you're working, you keyframe, move, keyframe, um, and then you scrub and then you play blast and blah, blah. Whereas, uh, where the engine is being used now, it's usually because there's very expensive people in the room who want answers that now. If it stops and they end up checking their phone to see what's going on, you've kind of lost it. Um, and that's that's the difference. It's like, what is it you're doing in previs that could be done real time? And if you can do it real time, then we'll get the director to come into the room and the DP and the exec from Marvel and they can see it and we'll get an answer right now instead of, previsiting you know four or five times and then in a month we finally get buy off on something uh, that's that's the promise of the real time stuff and how would the virtual production change the jobs um, in the future it's i think it will uh, i mean apart from obviously learning the, the the software but it's just software um it's more it's just being Again, it makes you more nimble. It's just the more nimble you are, the more you're open to ideas. It's like improv, basically. If you're an actor versus an improv actor, you'll be on your toes being asked to improvise a lot. Can you do so-and-so? And you've just got people standing around. Um, 
that'll be one of the differences. Um, they'll always, and again, VFX wise, be lots of time spent quietly noodling on stuff. Um, but any of the real time, there'll be a, a, you know, a bigger sort of push on being able to interact with clients. It's a bit more like being on stage in a way, like a stage play. Um, but the nice thing is that bit, you can't ship that out to some distant corner of the world um, because the people are right there in the room. So it's a good place to be. That's one of the, one of the reasons for investigating. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you very much for all your time and for the excellent presentation uh, and talking to our uh, guests here. I think it's uh, one past six now. Ooh, I'm going to get into trouble, up. aren't I? <laughs> yes. Uh, I will stay uh, here with Antonella and we'll try to answer some of the more specific questions relevant to the college uh, and the escape studio uh, well. admissions. Uh, I wish you all the best. <laughs> <laughs> and look forward to seeing you again sometime. Indeed. And, and thanks again for having me. And good luck, everybody out there. It Thank you very much, much Brad. Thank, Thank you. Brad. See you later. See you. See Bye. you. Bye. Hi, Antonella. We have some uh, interesting questions. I would like to give you the floor to respond to, if you wish. Yeah. Uh, Related. Sure thing. So I'm just uh, feel free, obviously, to uh, pick up the question. Um, I'm here, obviously, guys, to help also for about the uh, admission process. So just to um, remind you, so the next intake, guys, we start on the 28th. If you're considering both sure course and MA, um, and if you're considering the MA, we also have a partial scholarship. And the deadline to apply, receive an offer, and pay your deposit is pretty much next week so is um at the end of next week so it's by the 15th of may so if you are considering um the program anyway you want to be considered for the scholarship please uh submit an application as soon as possible and i will try to speed up the process a little bit um saying that so um let's see so what uh -uh. Feel free, obviously, to ask any question you would like to ask Iliana as well. So, about the course or any curiosity you still have. There is a question about whether this is uh, going to be a recorded uh, session, this webinar, and whether there is any possibility for people to look into it again because they joined us later. Uh, is that? Yeah, totally. Obviously, all the sessions are always recorded, so we will be able to share it. Um, I will, as usual, I will send a follow up um, after the event. So feel free to get in touch with me by email, guys. Um, and then, uh, obviously, I will, I will be happy to have a chat or to provide you with more information. Or if you want the recording, I will ask our colleague in the Evans team to share it with you. So no worries. Uh, there is a question from Eva Zahova. Will there be an online version of the course in 2022? Yeah, this is uh, yeah. this is still a good question <laughs> that we don't know because um, you know obviously we still need to determine the, the next dates. So for this year, we only have one intake that is the June one. Um, we still need to uh, figure out the schedule for next year. Obviously, as soon as we will know, I will let you know, guys, too. Um, probably this will be by the end of this year, but still don't know. Um, and also about the online program, I have to say that this has been like very successful. Um, you know, before um, we didn't uh, have any online option to be honest so it's something that we have introduced later on with the pandemic but it's been so successful that we have kept obviously both option um and i don't know if you want to say also a few words about this ilian about so your students how they dealt with the online on site things but uh it's still a, a good option that anyway you can choose uh where you want to attend the line uh so remotely via a live platform or you want to be anyway on site because I, I think it's very also subjective and personal it depends and very like from person to person but um but yeah it's good to have both option and probably we will like to keep it uh but i still can give you a precise answer on that <laughs> yes in terms of uh, working remotely uh, there hasn't been a huge difference in the outcome um 
I think some students prefer to be in the classroom. Some students prefer to be at escape because it's just uh, nice to be mixing with other people and have social contact uh, and get to know each other personally. Um, in terms of time, um, I think it's quite helpful when you don't have to travel to the studios and back. It can save some time and produce probably more um, content. But for me, for, for my class, there hasn't been really a huge difference in terms of result and uh, learning. Um, everything is going really, really well. Uh, we have a really nice collaborative project ongoing at the moment, and it is really nice to see students connecting uh, online as well with the other classrooms. So yeah, that's that's really successful on this end. Um, there was one question about, um, yeah, there was one question about what is um, uh, visual development? What's the difference between visual development and uh, previs? Um, well, as you as you probably already uh, understood from the presentation from Brad, there is no really strict borderline between the processes. It's all um, turning into one thing slowly, uh, especially with the virtual production as well. The the sooner you get to to the to the vision of the director the better and you can use any techniques and tools of course there is a production process which is part of the milestones in the pipeline where you have to be really working specifically towards developing the art uh, developing the uh, the world uh, visually and that's slightly more um, towards the production uh, and we are teaching this in the course as well we're teaching all the techniques that are needed uh, to uh, contribute to the production, but you're not going to be uh, assessed on um, knowledge in VFX. You will be assessed on previous and story boarding for, for the coursework. Uh, I hope this is <laughs> making some more clear sense. Um, yeah, yes. that's fine. Um, thank you, Idiana. <laughs> I don't know, guys, if you still have any other doubts or any other question um, that you would like to ask. Um, otherwise, I guess we can wrap it up. And yeah. um, and of course, yes, if you still do anyway, like I said, I will send an email, I will send a follow up. So feel free to get in touch. Also, if you still have questions for Iliana, I will be happy, obviously, to um, pass them to, to her. And um, I hope you enjoy and you find also this event very helpful. Um, it's the first time actually we are doing this with an industry partner, industry mentor. And I guess it's very useful also to understand how uh, the course is structured and uh, also what are the useful insights that you know the, the course offer both so that you can actually take from escape so um the value actually that you can get from a course um with us so and also like the industry feedback scheme that i think is very important about well, if you want to work in creative industries um so saying that, anyway, um, thank you very much um, for your time, Ileana, today, and also obviously Fred. Um, and thank you very much, guys, for attending. I hope um, that you have enjoyed. Thank you, Antonella, and thank you, everyone, from the guests as well. Hope it was good and hope to have another one of these interesting uh, events soon. Antonella, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye, guys. Bye from me, bye.